I wish that you have a very successful journey uh, in the next two years and you achieve your goal of uh, success at JE Advanced okay, and other examinations of choice. So you must have had an introductory session with uh, Hemant sir in physics uh, with uh, vectors uh, being the first topic you're starting in that regard. We will be uh, parallelly doing another topic uh, in physics, which is basic calculus and more about that coming up. Now, before I start, just a couple of simple things I want to discuss. One is that uh, initially we will uh, we will be referring only to the module of IIT and sub okay, for the first few weeks. Uh, and by the time we have uh, covered some portion of basic calculus and learned some of the basics, um, you will be then in a position where you can refer to uh, some additional material so there will be some optional reference material that i will refer you to and uh, you can you know, start going through those things uh, but at any rate like uh, the material which is part of the iit and sub um, module is uh, more than sufficient for your reference at this stage okay that's the first thing uh, secondly uh, about the uh, protocol of this lectures yeah, this is calculus for physics, I use that is correct. I will discuss uh, more about that. Okay, this is a physics lecture, I'm coming to that. Okay. Uh, secondly, about the protocol for the lectures, um, it is going to be as interactive as, as possible. So uh, while uh, in general, all of you can be in mute mode so that uh, there is no noise that comes in the background, but at any stage you feel like discussing something or raising a query or asking a question, uh, you can always unmute yourself and uh, just go ahead and ask the question like a normal class okay or you can also send me text messages uh, the way you are doing uh, some of you okay so that's the second thing third thing is like uh, it would be helpful if you have a separate notebook for for this uh, track of physics and a separate notebook for the vectors track of physics so that you can uh, keep uh, keep track of things uh, in future when you want to revise, etc. Okay. Uh, I will be sending you class notes uh, in PDF form. So you don't need to make very detailed fair notes. Okay. You should just have a notebook so that you're jotting down the important points. Uh, and more importantly, whatever numerical solving that we're doing, uh, you can go on, uh, you know, trying those questions out yourself and even when I'm solving something on the board, you should do the mathematical steps very carefully so that you are clear about that uh, then and there. Okay. So that's about the notebook thing. So I think that's it. We have covered all the do's and don'ts. <clears throat> Let's begin with the physics now. Okay, so this is uh, our first physics session. And uh, we are going to discuss a topic in physics called basic calculus. So interestingly, this is going to is going to feel more like mathematics than physics. And to a certain extent, it is true. What we are going to discuss is something uh, which is a very important mathematical technique in physics. Okay. However, this branch of mathematics calculus itself evolved in such a way that it's very closely associated with physics. Uh, its invention came about uh, in the effort for solving certain physics problems, etc. Okay, so let's get right onto it. So, <clears throat> you know, we have that very important uh, event in physics uh, when sometimes in the sometime in the late 1600s, uh, Newton observed a falling apple, you know, so-called like that is how the legend or the story goes that he was sitting in his garden and he observed um, a falling off apple and he realized that its speed increases as it's coming towards the ground. And from there, he was able to discover or he was able to give rise to the theory of gravity itself. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, obviously there were a lot of thoughts and deductions which had been going on in his mind for years before that. And that was just the Eureka moment. It's not like, you know, it suddenly all came in a flash. But anyhow, that's how the legend and the story goes. So the story about calculus also almost uh, starts from that point of time itself, because uh, Newton was the one who started uh, the whole concept of calculus uh, as he was solving 
you know issues in physics related to motion and particularly uh, accelerated motion we will understand that in just a bit uh, of course uh, you know simultaneously there was also lebnis in france who was um, developing uh, similar type of mathematics and uh, again as legend goes that there was some communication between them in between but uh, eventually there was also some fighting between them there were some controversies between them about who is the proper inventor of calculus etc anyhow so newton and leibniz are credited with the uh, invention of calculus and the purpose of the invention of calculus was mostly to solve uh, initially to solve distance and time related or motion related problems in physics but also it went on to achieve a lot of things in geometry etc okay so anyhow uh, calculus in that sense is a branch of mathematics but uh, it becomes very essential in physics essential to understand physics just like vectors so from this point onwards physics is going to deal in the language of vectors and calculus and hence uh, we start with this uh, portion of calculus okay so one of the things which is very important uh, in calculus which is a very central idea in calculus is the concept of rate of change okay and i'm sure many of you are familiar with you might have heard the term differentiation or derivative or instantaneous rate of change etc but here i'm going to just start with you know some of the basic ideas so rate of change is a concept which is very important in uh, in calculus and the example that we took of, of object in free fall that itself demonstrates a concept of rate of change very nicely okay for example if we look at the speed of an object in straight line motion we look at the speed of this object with respect to time so if we just visualize a graph of speed with respect to time p versus time now suppose this graph happens to be of this shape okay that means speed is what we call a linear function of time in this particular example and for example we know that the initial speed let's say is 10 meters per second then the speed after some time is let's say after a time of 5 seconds the speed has increased to 15 meters per second then at 10 seconds speed has become 20 meters per second and so on and so forth so if it's a linear function of time then one thing we can understand is that the rate of change of speed would become acceleration and that would be nothing but the slope of this line so when we talk about a linear graph or a straight line graph the concept of slope is something very easy to understand why it is very easy to understand because whether i so let me magnify this a little okay so whether i am looking at the rate of change between this point and this point okay or i am looking at the rate of change between this point and this point or i am looking at the rate of change between this point and some other point like this they would all be the same because the line has an equal inclination at all points this theta is the same as this theta okay that's a simple fact from geometry that you can understand all these triangles that we are drawing here they are right angled similar triangles so they have all got the same angle so you can see that the rate of change in this case would be how much how much would be the acceleration or the rate of change constant sir 1 meter you calculate 1 meter per information that is 1 meter per second 1 meter per second square 
Yes, that's correct, Mansi. Anyone else? Yeah, Harleen, you were saying something, Madam. One meter per second square. Sir. Uh, sorry, come again. I I didn't hear you. Yeah, Harleen. Hello. Yeah, yeah, but I can hear you. Yeah, I was I was saying the slope would be one meter per second square. Very good. That's correct. The slope is one meter per second square. Okay. So it's very easy. It's just uh, like you calculate the slope of any general straight line. Okay. It is the change in the y coordinate divided by the change in the x coordinate, right? So in this case, we would say that the acceleration is the change in speed divided by change in time. Okay. And that could be now if we compare, for example, these two points A and B, you could see it is VB minus VA divided by time at the point B minus time at the point A. So from that, you would come to the conclusion that it is one meter per second square. And like that, if you compare any other points, like you compare these two points, so it would be also equal to VC minus VD or VD minus VC, whatever divided by this time difference okay. or any other pair of points. So that is the property of the straight line. Okay. But the whole point is that very few things in the physical world around us follow such an ordered kind of you know, definition or you know, change with respect to time in such a coordinated manner that the rate of change is uniform, right? So we might have a situation where we have let us say velocity with respect to time or speed with respect to time being a graph which is something like this now. Suppose the graph is like this. Okay. Then when we talk about the point of acceleration as the rate of change of speed. Okay, I will come to the more technical definition of acceleration in uh, in kinematics when we will see that acceleration is a, actually a vector quantity. So it is the rate of change of velocity with respect to time. But here we are again talking in context of motion along a straight line. Okay, so we can excuse ourselves and just use casual scalar notation that acceleration is the magnitude of the rate of change of speed. So I'm just writing it as a scalar. So it is the rate of change of speed with respect to time. So you can say A is equal to delta V by delta T, where the symbol delta, as you know, means change in. Okay. But the question becomes, now you can see that the slope of this graph. So further, you would see that this is basically something to do with slope of the V versus T graph. But now we have a slight dilemma. Okay. You can see that the graph is sloping in such a way that it's not uniform everywhere. Right? You can see that if you take an interval of time over here, in this much time, the velocity has increased by this much. But if we take a larger interval, uh, if we take an interval of time a little bit later, in the same interval of time, let's say, okay, the velocity is increased by a much larger amount. Because that is the nature of this curve. It's, it's, it has a variable slope. And it has a variable slope in such a way that between the points A and B, its, it's slope is less steep compared to it is between the point C and D. So then the question becomes that how do we define the acceleration at all? Because the rate of change of speed with respect to time is not constant at all. So this is one of the central ideas in calculus. Okay? And as we move along later today, we will see that now we will have to talk about two types of acceleration. We will have to talk about two types of rate of change. We'll have to see that there is a rate of change in context of average rate of change. And that will be between two instants of time. Okay. 
or we can say for an interval of time that is delta t equal to some t2 minus t1 and then we will have a different definition which is instantaneous rate of change for example if you are talking about acceleration in the graph above it means what is the rate of change of velocity with respect to time not between time t1 and t2 but at a particular instant of time so this will be the rate of change at an instant and this is the one which is going to be little bit more abstract and this is the one that calculus is going to deal with okay now before we start with calculus okay since it is going to be you know a set of mathematical principles above all okay so let's discuss a little bit about maths okay bear with me over here and let's get back to you know the the general principle of calculus with that so can anyone out of you tell me what is the what is the difference between maths and physics one of the i mean there are many differences between maths and physics but can any of you point out what is what is the major difference between maths and physics like physics deals with the laws of like like moving objects or things and maths deals with basically numbers and all that sort physics deals with the uh, dhruv come again the laws of laws of like uh, how things work around us like like right but what kind of things can you tell me physics deals with what kind of situations sir it could be motion of a particle ah uh, it could be motion of a particle that's sir, correct I electric use. field magnetic field everything yeah. Uh, all That's, around us, sir. It describes how the nature functions, sir. How the nature functions, right? A uh, little bit more specific. Anything about nature, like what part of nature physics deals with? Sir, it only Matter. deals with how things happen, not why things happen. Uh, okay, I will. Sir? Yes, 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 Manji. Sir, uh, I think the major difference between math and physics is causality. Because okay. like we have an expression in physics, so for example, let's equal to gm by r square. Okay. So in, in mathematicians would say that we can also write it as r is equal to root of gm by s, but that is actually is not correct because we don't measure uh, distance that way. So uh, I think that is the difference between math and physics. right so what uh, manji is saying that uh, physics deals with causality what some something is causing another event whereas maths does not deal with causality it just deals with the equations or the relationship between numbers number systems etc right manji yes sir exactly yeah yeah somebody had just raised their hand you can unmute yes. yourself yeah beta physics tries to define laws that explain the behavior of things around us yeah yeah so uh, i'm i'm just uh, going to summarize so nishay also for example has sent on message that physics as theory maths is more of practical physics is understanding of physical world about forces maths is about numbers practically okay uh, yeah anirudh uh, you can go ahead so what is uh, uh, true in mathematics does not have to be truly true in uh, physics no so sometimes That's time also come as uh, minus but uh, it cannot be true in physics okay that's an interesting theory yeah okay abhinav you had something to say no sir no sir means okay. one of them said my point okay okay now see one one important point which many of you are expressing but do not ex exactly in the same words is physics deals with physical phenomena in the universe around us so what do we mean by physical phenomena okay what we were saying that you know it deals with everything in the natural world around us but it's a bit more specific it deals with a certain category of events and phenomena in the natural world around us and those are called the physical phenomena so what are physical phenomena they are uh, events or phenomena such that 
or because of which physical quantities affect each other physical quantities affect each other okay. for example the motion of a falling object is affected by the gravitational field of the planet in which it lies or if we are looking at the motion of a charged particle like the electron in orbit around the nucleus it is the charge of the nucleus the electrostatic force so yes force becomes uh, one very important uh, you can say medium of how things affect each other how physical quantities affect each other and we all understand what physical quantities are they are quantities that can be measured so the moment we are talking about quantities that can be measured okay we are not talking about necessarily invented quantities we are talking about things that exist in the physical world around us so physics is born out of natural sciences which is observation and deduction about the physical world around us the natural world around us whereas mathematics is not that mathematics is an invention it is complete imagination okay whether we talk about number systems in maths or we talk about operations between number systems okay we talk about theorems we talk about equations and algebra we talk about geometry which is a visualization of those kind of relationships between numbers uh, maths deals mostly with invented situ situations or it is completely man made or invented yeah you can say that geometry does deal with things that we see in the physical world around us so yes there is a confluence in that sense between physics and maths and also you can say that whatever we describe about the physical world around us in physics we describe in the language of mathematics so we attach some equations to it we attach some algebra to it we attach some operations between those type of numbers so there is in that sense a confluence between them and you can say physics speaks in the language of maths okay but if you look at the origin of maths and physics physics evolved from natural science which is trying to describe things that already exist in the world around us they are not invented by us it is our way of explaining our way of trying to understand what is happening whereas maths deals with uh, pure imagination to begin with okay the the invention of number system the invention of uh, any operations between number systems they they are all completely man made okay so to that extent okay one of the important things that maths deals with is equations for example we have a very simple equation that if we take square root of 2 it is nearly 1.414 but it is an irrational number actually right it is a non recurring non terminating decimal number Now you might think that this is something very complex. Where it has come from? Okay. Now there is a relationship between numbers, equations, and geometry. Now you can explain this number square root two geometrically also. Okay, and it is like one of the you know earliest discoveries in maths in terms of history of maths that was done, which is based on a geometrical figure that was discovered, which was something like this. this geometrical figure just describe what is the meaning of the term root 2 if you have a square like this which has dimension of single unit now we know that the diagonal of this square is root 2 units now do you know what is the proof of this that the diagonal is equal to root 2 units anybody has a pythagoras theorem pythagoras theorem pythagoras theorem okay very good but then pythagoras theorem is also like is there any geometrical proof of this like pythagoras theorem is like an equation yeah trigonometry and 45 degrees okay but then trigonometry i think came after pythagoras theorem right so i'm talking about like you know really ancient fundamental type of mathematics 
सर वी कैन मेक थ्री ट्रायंगल्स एंड द एरिया विच द थ्री ट्रायंगल्स हैव इज इक्वल टू द ट्रायंगल विथ uh which we made in the square right here okay like That's we it. did it in practicals in school mm -hmm. uh how the pythagoras theorem was derived yeah sim something very good something similar to that okay so i think what you are saying is uh, going to be something like this right i'll just demonstrate it सर आयुष या आयुष सो इंस्टेड ऑफ दिस फिगर ना इफ आई नाउ मेक अ फिगर लाइक दिस वेर आई जॉइन दीज मिड पॉइंट एंड इंस्टेड ऑफ माई ओरिजिनल स्क्वेर बींग ऑफ डायमेंशन वन आई मेड इट ऑफ डायमेंशन टू So now in the figure you can see there are two squares, the inner square and the outer square. So if the outer square had dimension of two, okay, what is the area of the outer square? The area of the larger square is two into two, that's four. Okay. Now what should be the area of the inner square? Two. Yeah, it should be basically four minus. You can say if these areas, if these areas are equal to a one each, it should be four minus four times a one. Correct. So, okay. Now, if these are all the midpoints, so these are all triangles of one by one. Okay. So each of these triangles. Are having area how much? Half square unit. Half. Okay, so this is four square units minus four times half square units. So that is becoming two square units. Now, whatever the length of this, whatever this length, this should be equal to L square. Yes, sir. So what this is showing us that L is equal to square root of two. and it's very easy to prove that uh, it is very easy to prove that area of a triangle is half base into height all we have to do is you know break a rectangle into two triangles show that they are congruent okay and from the basic idea that area of that rectangle is length into height or length into breadth it's very easy to show that if you have this this should be the case now you can distort this figure from a rectangle into a combination of rectangles etc if you have a non right angle triangle and show that it is half base into height instead of half perpendicular into base etc so this this was like you know one of the very early proofs in maths uh, that you know if you draw two perpendicular lines of length l each then the hypotenuse that you will get will be root 2 l even though root 2 is a very complex number in that sense you know okay uh, anybody knows a proof of pythagoras theorem you were talking about pythagoras theorem a while back so by similarity can we do that sir yeah, there is a similar figure okay uh, now the point i'm trying to make is like you know in the evolution of maths uh, we have pythagoras theorem become something which is significantly more important because there is a generality to it okay. pythagoras theorem is like a jump in concept from what we have just discussed where you have two lines which are of length l each and this perpendicular is root 2l versus pythagoras theorem now talks about a generality that this could be any length this could be any base but if they are perpendicular then the hypotenuse will be given by the formula square root of l square plus b square so this is a gen this is a generalization of this this is specific this is more general and from this for example that lot of geometry evolves okay a lot of so the simple proof of this the simplest proof that i have seen till date okay you i mean there are so many different sir, proofs for making triangles sir yeah yeah by making triangles okay so now if we make 
So if we just join any point over here with any point over here. So since this was a square, this was a square of dimension L by L. So now if we have taken this to be some A and this to be some B, then this will also be B and this will also be A because we can see that A plus B is equal to L. So now if we further just extend this in such a way that get this kind of a shape. So again, these are also broken into A and B. The other sides are also broken into exactly A and B. This is this figure can show us a very simple proof of sorry, this this one is yeah. This one is B again, this one is A again. So this can now give us a very simple proof that if these are some C each. My figure is not very exact, so the middle thing is looking like a rectangle, but it's actually a, a square. You can see that. Okay. So now you can very easily see that C square is the area of this one. And it should again be L square minus four times half AB. And L is nothing but A plus B. So you have this very interesting formula that it's A square plus B square. Of course, now this will lead us to the whole question that where did this one come from? A plus B whole square is equal to A square plus B square plus two AB. Now you can all like argue that, okay, it came from algebraic expansion. Okay, that you just, you know, apply the distributive property. So all that is fine, you can do all this, okay. But uh, it's very interesting that even this can be proved geometrically. So in fact, I will give that as a homework assignment for you. Prove the formula A plus B whole square by geometry using area like in the above proofs. or any other method other than algebraic expansion. Sir, should we send it to you on WhatsApp? Yeah, you can, uh, or you know, like you can do it in your notebooks when you're revising uh, today's uh, class later, and you can send me, uh, a, a, you know, a photo of it on WhatsApp later, or we'll discuss it in the next lecture also. Okay. Okay. So these are some of the interesting things in maths. Okay. Now, one of the concerns, okay, one of the ideas that we will explore from maths, which also becomes important in calculus uh, and in our physics, is the whole idea of infinity. Infinity, and later we will discuss another idea called infinitesimal, which means infinitely. small. Oh. Now in mathematics, you know, infinity has a very simple definition. Infinity has a definition that it is a number so large that infinity plus or minus x is equal to infinity, where x is a finite number. Okay. But the interesting thing about infinity is Okay, we can, for example, have an infinite sequence which has a finite value. An infinite sequence or an infinite series can have a finite value. And this is just an idea that I'm exposing to you to which will become important as we explore more about calculus. For example, if we have this number, this kind of sequence, one plus, I mean, one by four plus one by four square plus one by four cube, going up to one by four to the power n, where n is tending to infinity. 
Do you know how much the value of this should be? Anyone has the idea? So not sure, but I guess one. Like it's somewhat related to Zeno's paradox. Like what I've read. I'm not very sure about the answer. Uh, come again. You are thinking it's a paradox for. So I said it's a Zeno paradox. Like in zero Zeno paradox, it is one by two plus one by four plus one by eight. Like it adds up to like uh, what yeah, one. So, uh, Drew, does it have a value or does it not have? Okay, you're saying it has a value of one. Okay. Yeah, Aryan. So can, some, yeah, Aryan. Tell me. So can you please just give two minutes to solve this problem? Yeah, yeah. Just try it out. Yeah, Mansi, you were saying something, but. Is this a ge geometric progression? Yes, yes, it is a geometric progression, right? If you're familiar with geometric progression, then you know that there's a formula for this, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So is it three by sixteen? Uh, no, beta. Try again, sir. One, one by three. Yes, I use very good. That's correct. Sir, it's yes. Aryan. Uh, sorry, I uh, Aryan. My mistake. Yeah. Uh, yes, Prabhas, your answer is correct. Piyush, your answer is correct. Yes, Ibrahim, you had something to say, beta. Oh uh, no, sir. Okay, Aditya, it's correct. Okay, Vedant, correct. So, what is the method you people have used to find it out? Like you have used the formula of uh, geometric progression. No, sir. Yes. Hmm? Okay. Now I'll show you a very interesting way that we can visualize this problem. Okay. So what I'm trying to show is the relationship between you know algebraic relations and geometry and how that can be very interesting. Okay. So it's going to Take me a bit of time to construct the geometry. Okay, so you just continue on what you're doing in the meantime. So hopefully that is a square. Sir, actually, I used the formula of uh, in uh, sum up to infinite series of GP. Of GP, no? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's very logical way of solving it. A by 1 minus 1. Right. Hmm. Uh, so, like, we can also do it algebraically, like, like we take the uh, 1 by 4 common and then, like, 1 by 1 plus, uh, like, 1 by 4 plus 1 by 16. So, like, right. if we equate the whole thing when the so you are using the property of infinity. Form will be x is equal yes. to right, and you are showing that it has a finite sequence. Uh, this thing, it has a yeah. finite sum. Okay. Yeah, it is converging at a point. Yeah, it is converging. So that is actually the more important idea that we want to explore here. That infinity doesn't necessarily mean that it cannot, you know, just because the sequence has infinite terms, it doesn't mean that it might not give us a finite answer. It can give us a finite answer. So such a sequence is called a converging series. In fact, in mathematics proper, it is called a converging series. Okay. So I'm going to demonstrate that same point very interest in a very interesting way. Like I'm going to demonstrate as in I've picked it up from somewhere. I didn't invent this solution, but I found it very interesting when I saw it. Okay. So now I'll just zoom out again so that Yeah, so I'll just zoom out of this so that we can see the whole thing again. Okay, so now just assume that what I have originally over here, the outer thing, no? it's a square. Yeah, so a lot of you have got the answer one by three, which is correct. So this is a square of again one unit, okay, by one unit. 
it might be one meter by one meter or whatever, one feet by one feet, etc. Okay. So now, what is the area of this box? This box, if I write it as A1, A1 is 1 by 4? 1 by 4. Square units? Yes, yes sir. Now, what is the area of this box? 1 by 16. A2 will be 1 by 16, correct? A3 will be? 1 by 64. 1 by 64. And like that, if I go to the last one here, one after the other, like this okay now can you visualize that the total area of all these put together is one third of the whole squares area is it making sense what i'm saying if i have this infinite sequence just imagine i have infinite number of these divisions so can we say that the sum of a1 plus a2 plus this should be one third of the total area of the larger square Sir, how? Okay, so let's let's understand that. Ajay, just visualize this. Is it looking like it's like you know? Just if you were to experiment, like you know, this is going in a sequence like this. Okay. Now, now let's think like this. Okay. This area is the same as this and this. Yes, sir. Right? Yes, sir. So, if you consider this as a whole unit, this whole part as one unit. Okay. So this is one third of the whole unit. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Same here. This is A2 and A2. This is A3 and A3. This is A4 and A4. So for every one box I have of red color, I have two other boxes which are not shaded and they are of the same area each. And this sequence goes on forever. Okay. So isn't it an interesting way of exploring the same formula, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, so this is like a very interesting idea of how we can have a sequence of infinite terms, but that sequence gives us a finite answer. And this is going to like, it's just, it's not just something, you know, to make the class interesting. Although I hope that it is making it interesting. It is going to relate to what we are going to do in calculus uh, in, in some time itself. Okay, so uh, it's, it's just to plant that thought in your mind that, you know, we can have a sequence of infinite terms, but that can give us a finite answer. Okay, uh, so that is the geometrical way of dealing with it. Another way of dealing with it, I'll just give you a hint, okay, which you can try later as homework, is that if you have any series like this, it is going to infinite terms. Let me write that as the sum S. Okay. Now, if you multiply this with four, this sequence, you'll get four S, okay. Now, 4s you will see is 1 plus 1 by 4 because this term was 1 by 16, this was 1 by 64. So, if you multiply the 4 inside, you'll get a sequence like this. Now, that is going up to 4 to the power n plus 1 or rather 4 to the power n minus 1. But because n is tending to infinity now, it makes no difference. So, 1 by 4 to the power n or 1 by 4 to the power n minus 1. Because n is tending to infinity, they're both tending to zero. Also tends to zero, as n tends to infinity. So that, so now you can relate this first equation with the second equation. So I'm, I'm not going to complete this solution for you people, okay? But it's like a proof of the, you know, formula of geometric progression. If you have seen geometric progression in maths, if you haven't seen it, doesn't matter. It's not actually part of your class 10. Okay, so you can use equations one and two above. Algebraically two. That summation of one by four to the power i i going from 1 to n, n tending to infinity, should be equal to 1 by 3. So this infinite sequence should give us a very finite answer. Okay. So that's that was the other idea. Okay. Now coming back to the relationship between maths and calculus and, you know, so we have seen earlier that mathematics 
it deals it's an invented subject it has invented things like number systems operations operators it has equations and algebra but some of these are also geometrically interpreted so there is geometry itself and there is also geometrical interpretation of algebraic equations so this thing is something that is going to be very important for us in calculus okay. so what we are going to see is that in general as far as calculus is concerned first of all we are going to deal with something called a function so what is a function it is a relationship between two variables okay. so what is a variable it is a parameter that can have a value and that value is by an assigned number so for example we can have functions where the variables can take only integer values we can have functions where the variables can take real number values we can have functions where the variables can take only natural number values etc etc okay but the function is such an operator or such a relationship that it defines an algebraic equation or it defines a rule by which one variable is connected to another variable okay so we represent a function by this kind of a symbol okay. so this would be read as the variable y is a function of the other variable x so the moment we write this in this form we are implying one thing we are implying that x is what we call an independent variable so what we mean by independent variable means that the value of x and obviously the value will be given by a number so the value of x is independent or you can say can is independently chosen okay but once we choose a value of x this function f it is some kind of rule okay or some kind of relationship that defines the value of y in terms of the value of x okay so y becomes what we call a dependent variable because we cannot now choose the value of y independently once we have chosen a particular value of x the value of y for a particular value of x okay is defined by that relationship by the relation or function okay so that is the definition of a function that it is a relationship between two variables where one of the variables and conventionally we we represent that variable by x but it could be represented by any other symbol so for example we could write v is a function of t so this could be for example a physics equation where velocity is a function of time t or we could write an equation that you know uh, q is a function of theta where theta is temperature and q is the amount of heat so in this case if we are writing an equation like this we are expressing heat q as a function of temperature theta so theta is the independent quantity and q becomes dependent on that in the equation so if we assume that temperature has a certain value then the equation will give us the related amount of heat or if we are calculating the velocity at a particular instant of time 
so if we fix the value of time to a particular value like 1 second or 5 seconds or 3 hours and 50 minutes or whatever then the velocity has a dependent value which is defined by this rule so such a such a relationship between two variables one of them being independent and the other one being dependent is called a function okay so we can just make a short note of this if you like okay so how we define a function we define it as a relationship between two variables okay variables being parameters which have numerical values or which are defined by a numerical value now the relationship is such that the variable on the right hand side okay is the independent variable in this case we have denoted by x and the variable on the left hand side which is defined as some relationship of x that becomes the dependent variable okay. of course you might say what happens if you know one parameter depends on more than one parameter like for example we might have a real life system where for example q which is the heat supplied it might depend on the temperature change but also on some other parameter like the mass of the object so in that case we will have to define q as a function of two things mass as well as temperature so yes there are functions which are called multi variable functions where one parameter depends on multiple variables not on one independent variable but more than one independent variable but at this stage we will start with the calculus of single variable functions so in this sense when i am saying that it is a relationship between two variables that means i am talking about single variable functions okay wherein what is happening the dependent variable okay depends on a single independent variable and not more than one of course it is also possible to have multi variable functions okay and it's nothing complicated you have seen many examples of it yourself already though you might not have seen it in this technical language that it is a function okay so there are also multi variable functions a very simple example is that we study that the distance of a point from the origin in a two dimensional plane depends on two things right depends on its x coordinate and its y coordinate so if i'm taking different points point a point b point c you can see x and y are independent variables because the independent values of x and y determine where this point a is but this distance r becomes dependent on that so x and y they are independent variables okay. and their values determine the position of a point But on the other hand r is the distance from the origin okay and this is something that becomes the dependent variable because this depends on the values of both the independent variables x and y so this is an example of a two variable function okay so you can say here that r is a function of x and y so r is a function of x and y so this is a bi variable function so obviously multi variable functions are more complex okay so in basic calculus we'll be dealing only with single variable functions okay. 
at a later stage in physics we will look at some kind of applications where there are multiple variable functions for example when we come to the chapter of work energy theorem we will see that there might be a system where potential energy of a system depends on two or three coordinates it depends on x y coordinate or x y z coordinate okay uh, we will see in electrostatics later in class 12 that the electric field at a particular point might depend on the three dimensional spatial coordinates x y z okay or we can have a situation where the field is varying with time as well as position okay so we will indirectly look at multi variable functions at a later stage but uh, in our dealing with calculus and in fact when you study calculus in maths also because let me tell you calculus is going to be a major portion of your maths syllabus in 10 plus 2 also and some of the fundamentals of that maths portion we are going to cover now itself in physics but even in your maths portion you don't have multi variable functions you will be studying the calculus only of single variable functions okay so now the next important thing is that so we have understood what a single variable function is let's look at some examples the most one of the most simple examples of a function you can see is y is equal to x okay that means whatever value of x i take the value of y is the same okay. but a more complex example would be let's say y is equal to x square or let's say y is equal to sin x okay so this is an example of a trigonometric function or for example y could be equal to x to the power sin x now this is a much more complex function this is what we call a transcendental function okay or you can think of it like a hybrid it's a hybrid of an algebraic and a trigonometric function is this one is for example an algebraic function or more specifically it comes in a polynomial category if we have this kind of general equation where these are all constants then this is called a polynomial function It is a type of an algebraic function. It's an algebraic function which is expressed as a power series. Okay. So when the maximum power is n equal to two, for example, you know that is called a quadratic equation. When the maximum power is n equal to one, it is called a linear equation. When it is three, it is called a cubic equation, and so on and so forth. So those are all subsets of polynomial functions. but remember all algebraic functions plus 1 this is an example of an algebraic function more specifically this is function so now also systematically understand the significance of some of these names etc but i'm just giving you examples yeah ibrahim it should be clear now right yeah yes sir okay yeah there was a drop in my connectivity for a moment but i think it should be clear now okay so you need not make a very detailed note of all this it is just uh, you know some basic names that i'm giving you now something bit more specific okay one very important point about functions suppose uh, you know we have a function y is equal to let's say square root of x and you compare this with the function y is equal to x square okay now can you tell me some difference 
between these two functions what is the difference between them sir uh, the first one is the square root function sir the yes. value of x should be uh, after uh, sir should always be greater than or equal to 0 and yes. uh, in the second function sir it is a square uh, square uh, square function exponential function sir so uh -huh. it has a increasing graph and the value is always positive yes the value of y is always positive right in the second yes, one hmm? but what we can say about x in the second one is there any restriction on x no sir we can take negative values of x also no yes sir okay so yeah so that is the thing no so so you know there is a hidden point that i'm trying and of course the second point you made is also correct y is always non negative in the second one same in the first one also it is non negative in case you think y can be negative in the first one it is not true i will again reiterate that point but let's first concentrate on the independent variable on the independent variable x in this function and on the independent variable x in the other function now earlier i said that x is value can always be taken independent of any other consideration so in the, that sense if you see na yahan pe there is a bit of contradiction of that na because there is some restriction on the value of x because x cannot be negative because square root of a negative number is not defined of course some of you might say that yes square root of a negative number is a complex number it's a uh, it's an imaginary number but here i'm talking about the domain of real numbers only okay because in physics we mostly deal with uh, you know parameters which have real values or real mathematical values because they are physical quantities okay so let's not go into complex numbers okay but the whole point is see x is still an independent variable why because the way i'm expressing the equation when i take the value of x i should not consider what y is okay i should just consider that x is value can be chosen randomly from what is called a domain set okay so x is value does not depend on any consideration on y whereas the moment i have selected an appropriate value of x the value of y becomes fixed according to that so that is the difference between saying that x is a independent variable whereas y is a dependent variable in both cases x is still an independent variable but in in the case of the left hand side root x x is values can be chosen from a smaller subset of all real numbers because that is the nature of the operation it is a square root operation so here x belongs to the set of 0 to plus infinity okay or you can say x is greater than equal to 0 but less than e infinity okay. whereas here there is no such restriction here x belongs to the set of minus infinity to plus infinity or you can say x can take any value from minus infinity to plus infinity sir all real so numbers ha huh, all real numbers okay so that is one difference that you can see over here this is all non negative real numbers you can say that was one difference okay any other difference that you can think of between here this and this in the first one the value of y is always less than the value of x yes that's and true second one the value of y is always greater than the value of x okay that's that's correct okay so y is always less than x in y equal to root x y is always greater than x is that true is y always greater than x no 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 na it means 0 to 1 yeah y is greater than x for x greater than 1 and y is less than x for x between 0 and 1 okay but what about negative values the second one y will always be greater than x for negative values no? yes because y is a positive number okay whereas x is in that case a negative number okay so it's a bit more complex okay right so that's also one difference okay but one more important point i'm looking for okay can you visualize the graph of these two functions i have not yet defined what is a graph but i'm sure all of you are familiar that any relation Relationship between x and y, we can always represent on the two-dimensional x-y plane by drawing a set of ordered, uh, uh, you know, a set of ordered pairs. If we draw them, can you see there is some difference in the nature of the two graphs? Okay, let me give you a hint. Uh, this, uh, if, if 
सर इफ द वैल्यू ऑफ ए इज बिटवीन जीरो एंड वन एक्स इन दिस केस फॉर द एक्सपोनेंशियल फंक्शन देन ग्राफ वुड बी डिक्रीजिंग सर फॉर द एक्सपोनेंशियल फंक्शन एक्स स्क्वायर वन इफ द वैल्यू ऑफ एक्स इज बिटवीन जीरो एंड वन देन एंड इफ इफ इट इज ग्रेटर देन द ग्राफ वुड बी इंक्रीजिंग एंड फॉर स्क्वायर रूट फंक्शन सर इट वुड बी डिक्रीजिंग लाइक अ कर्व गोइंग डाउनवर्ड ओके सो आई थिंक व्हाट यू मीन टू से द स्लोप ना द ग्राफ एनीवेज ऑलवेज इंक्रीजिंग यस बिकॉज़ द वैल्यू ऑफ वाई इंक्रीजेस एज एक्स इंक्रीजेस ना सो फॉर एग्जांपल इफ यू लुक एट द स्क्वायर फंक्शन बिटवीन 0 एंड 1 आल्सो इट्स लाइक दिस ना व्हेन आई इंक्रीज द वैल्यू ऑफ एक्स द वैल्यू ऑफ वाई इंक्रीजेस यस सर बट व्हाट यू आर सेइंग इज दिस पॉइंट दैट वाई इज लेस देन एक्स इफ एक्स इज बिटवीन 0 एंड 1 and greater than x if you know because this this point where they meet is so if you compare it with the with the straight line y equal to x you can see the straight line y equal to x is like this so in this part of the domain between 0 and 1 you can see that this lies below that straight line so the value of y is less than the value of x whereas here it lies above okay but also you can see that when you look at the negative part of the domain the function is decreasing as your x is increasing what is happening to the value of y it is decreasing at x equal to minus 1 the value of y is 1 but at x equal to minus 0.5 the value of y has actually decreased to 0.25 right yes sir okay. but you know one point i want to make here is that in this case if x is equal to for example plus 2 what is the value of y it's 4 yes sir if x is minus 2 the value of y is 4 again so the values of y repeat okay whereas are they going to repeat here no sir no sir no sir yes. here if you see later we will understand how this graph comes about it's this sort of a graph yeah it's a parabola okay actually both are parabolas but it depends on you know depends on the uh, Axis sir, of the parabola and all that. Okay. Parabola. Ha. Uh, so, so here you can see that every value of x, every value of y corresponds to a unique value of x. So this is what we call a one-one relation between x and y. A single value of x always gives you a single value of y. But this is an example of what we call a many-one relation. sir are that you is, referring to the cartesian product uh, i am referring to a relation in in context of set theory you know, okay. in terms of sets you now if, if i take the values of x and if i take the values of y here it is a one one mapping okay but here it is a many one mapping more than one value of x is referring to the same value of y so what this shows us that functions can be such that they are one one or many one relation so what that means in terms of the graph now of course we'll come more technically to the graph what that means in terms of the graph is that the functions graph can be such that when we draw a horizontal line like this it might show that the same value of y like y1 is repeated for more than one value of x like x1 and x2 so this is an example of a many one relation but on the other hand we could also have a graph which is like this we see this doesn't happen so this is a one one relation okay but both of these come in the domain of functions both of these come in the category of functions but what is important that 
वन मेनी रिलेशन आर नॉट फंक्शन दैट मीन्स वी कैनॉट डिफाइन अ फंक्शन एज सच अ सच अ रिलेशन वेर अ सिंगल वैल्यू ऑफ एक्स गिवज यू मल्टीपल वैल्यूज ऑफ वाई In other words, a single value of the independent variable must give us a unique value of the dependent value. Okay, so that is a rule in the definition of function. There are many one-many relations. There is no problem with the relation being one-many. Okay, so for example, if we have y square is equal to x square. Okay, this is a relation. Okay, but y. is not a function of x why it is not a function of x because in this relation a particular value of x does not give a unique value of y so therefore so for example in the above relation x equal to 1 gives you y square is equal to 1 that gives you y square minus 1 is equal to 0 so that gives you y minus 1 into y plus 1 is equal to 0 so y could be 1 or y could be minus 1 so therefore this is not a function this is not a function because a function is defined as that type of relationship where a single value of independent variable must give you a unique value of the dependent variable so that is one of the rules in the definition of a function for a function any value of x must give a unique value of y okay <clears throat> now if you think in terms of physics why we have made this rule for a function it would make sense you know because in physics we are relating uh, physical quantities which depend on each other through functions so for example if we are saying that um, you know velocity is a function of time or force is a function of time now we can't say that at a particular instant of time there are two values of forces okay now you might say yeah that happens in the quantum mechanical world that the position of a particle has a certain probability at a certain point but you know it might exist at two positions at the same point of time but that is more abstract in the world of quantum mechanics okay when we are talking about the more regular branches of physics like newtonian mechanics classical mechanics heat and thermodynamics electricity magnetism etc uh, when when something is changing with time at a particular value of time it should have a unique value it cannot have more than one value yeah nishay you were saying something So, but why is having different values? Uh, uh, why is having same value for different values of x? So, it is not entirely a unique value, right? Because for no, different values, no, that's a different thing. You can have the same value of y at different values of x. Okay, so for example, if if velocity is a function of time, okay, then velocity might be varying with time in such a way that you know first velocity increases, and then after some time it decreases because there's a deceleration. So, it had a particular value of velocity. initially when it was accelerating then it accelerated to a larger value and then it decreased and came back to that value so that's fine no you understanding the point no yes sir and you know, the same value of y is repeating for two values of x that's fine that's no problem but can you have a situation like this now think of this graph as a actual physical example suppose this is position versus time or displacement versus time okay now is something like this possible that at the same instant of time the same particle has a displacement of position of s1 also and a position of s2 also no sir you know so that that is why logically what we do na we exclude this kind of thing as functions we have we will say that s is not a function of time because s does not have a unique value for a particular value of time but here in this graph according to the, this graph we can say yes b is a function of time because for every value of time there is a unique value of b there's no problem that v repeats at two different times but at a given time there is there is no option there is a, only a particular value of v that it can have at that time so that comes in the domain of functions this does not come in the domain of functions 
ओके ना बेटा दिस इज क्लियर आई होप निश्चय यस सर ओके वेरी गुड so now having talked a little bit about functions we come to one very important property of a function okay acha before that graph of a function what is the graph of a function you can say it is a simple geometrical representation of a function where if y is equal to fx then what we do is we plot points on a two dimensional xy plane okay now this two dimensional xy plane is selected such that the y axis or the vertical axis is always taken as the dependent variable okay so again this is a convention that we follow and the x axis or the horizontal axis is always taken as the independent variable okay. and what we do is we plot points on this two dimensional plane as ordered pairs so for example we take x1 so we find y1 is equal to f of x1 so we plot the point x1 y1 Okay, then we take another point x two. So we calculate the value of y two as f of x two. So we plot the point x two y two, and so on and so forth. We plot a large number of points, and the more the number of points that we plot, you know, the more accurate our graph is going to be. Okay. So on a two-dimensional plane, so this is like typically how we would construct a graph from scratch. Given some function, we would first write down a series of ordered pairs or a series of points which you would then plot on the two dimensional plane and once we plot these points let's say these points are something like this x1 y1 x2 y2 going up to whatever last point then what we do is we try to join these points with the smoothest possible curve so like a 100% accurate graph would be one where we don't even have to join them because the points we have selected are so large in number okay now this is going outside the domain of function actually unfortunately so let's just yeah so let's say it's more like this okay so the more the number of points we select in plotting the graph and the more the number of points we draw therefore the more accurate our graph is going to be okay so what does the graph represent the graph of the function it is a curve on the xy space on the xy plane that represents the collection of all points Which satisfy the given relation. So, you have written graph of no function. Like, of the function. Okay. What is the graph of the function? Okay. So, the graph of the function. What it represents? It represents this curve. This curve that we have drawn. That only rep represents the graph of the function. So, what is happening? Every point on that curve satisfies the relation of the function. So, it is a collection. it represents a collection of all points in the xy plane that satisfy the relation y is equal to fx so this is what a graph is all about okay so it becomes a visual or a geometrical representation of a function so by observing the graph then we can make a lot of inferences about the function for example we can see that the function is initially increasing here then it's more or less flat for some time then it's decreasing we can see that the rate of change you know varies in such a way that you know so those those kind of things then we can see whether it is uh, a you know a many one type of 
relation or it is a one one type of relation and all these other properties can also better be visualized by the graph so the graph also becomes an important aspect of analysis of the function okay so if you want to write down any key points over here i'll just give you a minute but i'll be sending you these notes uh, in pdf form later anyway okay so you just need to if you need to jot down any important points you can do that but it's more about you know concentrating on the class and the learning part okay the notes you can make fair later also it's fine so let us look at some example graphs common examples of functions and their graphs okay now earlier when i gave you examples of functions i told you one of the simplest functions is the function y equal to x okay but as it turns out there is a function which is even simpler than that can you tell me a function which is simpler than y equal to x sir y, y equal to 0 constant so value y equal yes. to 0 x is equal to 0 so then y equal to 0 or y equal to any constant for that matter that is the simplest type of function okay uh, so we give that a specific name and that is called the constant function now the constant function you can say is not a function at all because y is not dependent on x y just has a fixed value yes nisha you are saying something sir if we are given two numbers x and y and y square is equal to x square then we can we cannot plot that function on graph right because it it is not technically a function uh we can plot on the graph see y square is equal to x square for a given value of x what will happen y will either be plus of root of x square correct or y will be minus of root of x square So that means y will be mod x, or y will be minus of mod x. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, now. So now what is happening? You can see that this in itself is a graph, and this in itself is another graph. You understanding? Y is equal to mod x is what type of graph? Y is equal to mod x is this sort of graph that it's y equal to x when x is positive, and it's y equal to minus x when x is negative. so these two graphs together represent y equal to mod x okay whereas y is equal to minus of mod x this so here when x is positive it is represented by y is equal to minus x and when x is negative it is represented again by minus y is equal to minus x okay so now the collection of these two i mean the collection of these four together this becomes the graph of the relation y square is equal to x square okay so now on this you put any value of x it will give you the corresponding values of y for example you put x equal to plus 2 you will see that the value of y can be plus 2 or the value of y can be minus 2 okay you put the value of x as let's say minus 4 so here also you can see that if you put x equal to minus 4 that means y square is equal to 16 so that means y is equal to plus minus 4 so it's showing you that y is equal to plus 4 y is equal to minus 4 so we can always draw a graph of any relation this is an example of a graph of a relation which is not a function so even that is possible but immediately the graph will show you that it's not a function how the graph is showing you that it's not a function is that you take any value of x or at least some values of x in the graph should show this property that is not giving you a unique value of y so we know that it's not a function right so nisha this point is clear na beta yes sir oh okay yeah so you can say that this is not even a function because it does not depend on x however like you know you can also say that y is equal to some constant into x to the power 0 so just because you know the power of x is 0 y is now independent of x okay so this is the simplest function that we take and this functions graph looks like a horizontal straight line 
depending on whether c is positive negative or c is even zero the horizontal straight line could be placed anywhere above the x axis on the x axis or below the x axis okay so this is the you can say this is a trivial function and right? the function that you don't even need to describe so this that that's simple now the next simplest category of function i had told you y equal to x but we'll take it as a whole category of functions or a family of functions those are called linear functions so linear functions have a general kind of relation like this y is equal to mx plus c where m is also a constant which you know is called the slope and c is also a constant which you know is called the y intercept and as you know the graph of these functions are straight lines so there can be various types of straight lines they can be straight lines with positive slope and positive y intercept they can be straight lines with positive slope but negative y intercept and so on and so forth there are different sub categories and you can even say that the constant function is a special case of the straight line function or the linear function where m's value is zero so you can also describe constant function as a special linear function where the value of the slope is zero so it can be like this it can be like this like this like this when passing through the origin also so this is one where m is negative but c is positive this is one where m is negative but c is negative this is one where m is negative and c is zero now the linear function has an important property that the slope of the graph that is delta y by delta x is constant and equal to m whereas if you see this function the constant function it has the even more trivial property that the slope of the graph is zero because y is not changing with x okay so horizontal line has a zero slope so that's another important property that these two graphs have the slope is zero um so like i didn't understand that how did you decide that m is positive and c is negative in all in all those cases could you please explain it again from the graph how we understood na okay so uh, in in coordinate geometry what is the slope okay the slope of a straight line is nothing but tan theta for it na it is equal to y2 minus y1 upon x2 minus x1 okay so slope of a linear function or what then becomes a straight line graph let's understand this so for example if i'm drawing a graph with a positive slope let's say going to look like this okay now if this angle is theta now you select any two points on the graph x1 y1 x2 y2 so if the equation of the straight line is y is equal to mx plus c then y2 should be equal to m times x2 plus c y1 should be equal to m times x1 plus c and suppose i have selected these points such that x2 is greater than x1 Now they could be negative, they could be positive, but basically x two is a larger number than x one. Then subtracting these two equations, 
will tell me that y2 minus y1 is equal to m times x2 minus x1. So in other words, the constant m is nothing but y2 minus y1 upon x2 minus x1. So now you can see from this that if m is positive, okay, that means y2 minus y1 will also be positive. Because I've already taken that x2 minus x1 is positive. Now this I've already taken the condition that x2 and x1 are points such that x2 minus x1 is positive. So this is the meaning of saying that it has a positive slope. That you can see that when x is increasing, correspondingly the value of y is also increasing. This is your y2 minus y1. This is our x2 minus x1. Right. So you can see that this angle it says that tan theta is equal to delta y by delta x, which is nothing but m which is y2 minus y1 upon x2 minus x1 for any two points. And in this case, it is positive. Right? It's clear now in this graph why it is positive. Right? Yes, sir. Okay. Now see the contrasting graph where we take a negative value of slope. So we have a graph of this kind of shape now. Now in this graph, if I select two points x1, y1 and x2, y2, now you can see that the angle that this makes with the positive x-axis, you know, when you carry this forward, is actually an obtuse angle. This angle that it will make, it's an obtuse angle with the positive x-axis. Okay, Of course, you might say that you can consider this angle but actually we have to consider the angle with the positive x-axis so this is our theta this angle here is actually 180 minus theta so anyhow so you can see that when x is increasing from x1 to x2 y is actually decreasing you can see that here y2 is less than y1 okay so therefore delta y by delta x which is y2 minus y1 upon x2 minus x1, it's a negative quantity. So the slope is negative because y2 minus y1 upon x2 minus x1 is nothing but the slope. So in my equation, if the slope happens to be negative, that means the graph will point in such a way, the straight line will point in such a way that y is decreasing as x is increasing. Okay. So for example, if I have y is equal to five minus two x, so here you can see that m is minus 2. So if delta x is equal to 1, then delta y will be equal to minus 2. If delta x is equal to 10, delta y will be minus 20 and so on and so forth. Whereas, for example, here, if I have something like this, y is equal to, let's say, 0.5x plus c. So m is equal to plus of 0.5. So that means delta y will be equal to, let's say, 1, when delta x is equal to 2, delta y will be equal to 200 when delta x is equal to 100. So when x is increasing, y is in, sorry, when delta x is 400, okay, and so on and so forth. So difference between positive slope and negative slope, I hope is clear. Yes, sir. So anyhow, this was again a trivial example because straight line is something that we're all well versed with. Now we start coming to the more interesting examples of functions. So the first, so, so the next degree of functions that we look at is quadratic functions. Okay. And we will look at quadratic functions in a lot of detail. In, but we will start with the most basic quadratic equation today, which is the simple parabola of y is equal to x squared. So here e, b, and c are constants. So this is an example of a, what we call a quadratic function. So for example, we could have y is equal to x square plus two, or we could have y is equal to three x square plus four x plus one. What so that will be bx, right? ax square plus bx. Oh, yeah, it will be bx minus three. Yeah. Because then 
I mean, if I had written a x square plus b x square, that means actually the coefficient of x was a plus b. No, but we want it to be a. So it's like this. Okay. So the the simplest example of this we will take is y is equal to x square, and we will look at the graph of this function. So if we want to draw the graph of this function, we have to take ordered pairs. For example, x is equal to zero corresponds to y being zero, but x equal to either plus or minus of 0.5 corresponds to y being 0.25. Okay, x being plus or minus of one corresponds to y being equal to one. X being plus minus two corresponds to y being four. So it has this very interesting nature, which we have discussed about earlier also, that it has a slope which is not constant. Okay, the shape of the graph is such that the slope is increasing as you go from zero to infinity, or the slope is decreasing as you go from minus infinity to zero. Actually, a lot many interesting things about the graph, not just the fact about the slope, but also that they're symmetric. No? For example, if we plot this point, zero comma zero, it's here. Okay. If we plot the point, for example, 0.5 comma 0.25 or minus 0.5 comma minus 0.2 or if we plot the point one comma one or minus one comma one and like this we go on plotting the points so we will see that the graph here has this kind of a shape it increases very rapidly and this side of the graph is just like a mirror image of it and in fact here it has to be a smooth curve so it has to be something like this okay so this kind of shape it is called a parabola okay the name given to it geometrically is a parabola or parabolic curve okay so now what we are going to do is through this only we are going to understand the difference between slope of tangent and slope of secant line. Okay. And through that, we are going to understand the difference between instantaneous rate of change and average rate of change, which is going to be the first thing about calculus that we will learn. So I had a question that like how exactly do we find like slope of like these parabolas like how to visualize them? Exactly, that is the point that we are coming to. That that is the point of interest over here. Okay, so next let us talk about. Let's talk about slope. Or rate of change. Of such a graph. So in general, what we will say is that for any function, y is equal to fx, okay, which has in general got a graph like this. So suppose I'm taking some arbitrary shape of the graph like this. Now, one is that, okay, we can say that between the points x1 and x2, okay, so if I've defined one point x1 over here and another point x2 over here. So as far as slope or rate of change is concerned, just a minute. So 
yeah coming back so one is that as far as rate of change or geometrically what we call slope of the graph is concerned we can define something called average rate of change okay. so that is nothing but the value of delta y by delta x in a given interval like x1 to x2 okay so in terms of slope what that becomes is that this average rate of change becomes slope of a line joining x1 y1 and x2 y2 okay so if i talk about that thing the average rate of change so i have to consider what this value is y1 i have to consider what this value is y2 so i have my two ordered pairs i have x1 y1 and x2 y2 now next thing i'll want to do is i'll want to join these two with a straight line okay and the slope of that straight line is nothing but the average rate of change between these two points because i'm defining the average rate of change as basically what the change in y upon the change in x so if you see in this graph this quantity over here is delta y which is y2 minus y1 and this quantity over here is delta x which is x2 minus x1 so if this angle is theta that's the same as this angle theta over here okay so we can see that delta y by delta x which is y2 minus y1 upon x2 minus x1 that becomes the slope of that particular line so this type of line is called a secant line there's a specific name given to it it is called a secant line so a line joining two arbitrary points but two distinct points that is called a secant line so our interpretation now becomes the graphical interpretation becomes that the average rate of change geometrically what that becomes equal to it becomes the slope of secant line okay that still doesn't answer your question that what is the instantaneous rate of change or what is the slope of the curve itself at a particular point but this will bring us closer home okay we will understand better about the second quantity which we are coming to which is the instantaneous rate of change once we clearly understand the relationship between this straight line or the geometry of this straight line the slope of this straight line and the quantity which is the average rate of change so hope this is clear to all of you you can make a quick note of this if you like so can you explain this again i got disconnected bye bye okay so now the property of a function that we are trying to understand next is now we are trying to understand the rate of change of a function or what we mean by the slope of the graph for any given function y equal to fx so let me assume that i have plotted the graph of that function and the graph is given by this curve this curve is the graph of the function so i will define two types of rate of change okay one is a rate of change for an interval for example you know if if we are if we are measuring things related to motion so we might we might relate distance with respect to time so this graph instead of y versus x it might be a distance time graph so in that case we might refer to something called average speed so what is average speed it is the average rate of covering distance with respect to time so whenever we are trying to calculate the average speed we will always calculate it for a given interval of time we won't say what was the average speed at 5 hours we will say what was the average speed from 12 o'clock to 12:30 or from 12:15 to 1:45 etc understood the point now yes sir so average rate of change is always defined for an 
interval. So that is the property of average rate of change. It is the value of change in y upon change in x. That is delta y by delta x for a given interval. Here, that interval will be from some value of x, let's say x1, to some value of x equal to x2. So the moment we have defined this this way, now let's interpret this in the graph, what it means. Okay. So if x1 is this point and x2 is this point, correspondingly, the y coordinate of the point on the graph, that is your y1, and your y coordinate at this x2 is nothing but your y2. Yes, right? sir. So in the graph, if I join these two points, x1, y1, and x2, y2, if I join these two points, let's say a and b, this point is a and this point is b. So if I join these two points a and b with a straight line, then you can see that geometrically, the slope of the straight line is nothing but what is delta y by delta x. Okay. So that means the definition of average rate of change becomes that it is equal to the slope of secant line. And what is a secant line? It is a line that joins the two points which you are selecting for your interval. Okay, sir. It's clear now, no? Yes, sir. So, but okay. this secant line can vary, right? Because of the nature of graph. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So if I say like, you know, find the average rate of change between zero and one, and then I say that, okay, now find it between two and four, there'll be different things. Unless, unless the graph is this type of thing, it's a straight line graph. If the function itself is linear, then the average rate of change will be the same for all intervals, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So that's another point that we can note down here that for a linear function, a function of the type y equal to mx plus c, delta y by delta x is equal to a constant. It's the same for any interval. Okay. And geometrically, you can understand why that happens because the graph itself is a line. So that means the secant line just overlaps the line itself. just overlaps the given line. So the second line between any two points is the same line. It's, it's the original line of the function itself. Okay. But then that is only linear functions. Huh? Not all functions are going to be linear. Not all real parameters are going to be linearly related. Okay. So that's only one very small fraction of all possible types of functions. Right. Okay. Now the second type of rate of change we'll define is the complex one. It is called the instantaneous rate of change. Sir, so for uh, average rate of change for a linear function, the slope of secant and slope of tangent will be same, right? Is same, exactly. Okay. But again, that is only linear function. So first of all, let us understand what we mean by instantaneous rate of change. We mean the rate of change of y with respect to x at an instant. So what we mean by an instant is at a value, a particular value of x. So first let's try to understand some kind of intuitive meaning of this. The instantaneous rate of change, again, when it was graph here, then how I would interpret this quantity intuitively that what is the instantaneous slope or the instantaneous rate of change at a given point. So again, let me take a more sort of general case, not the specific case of the straight line graph, but a more general case where the graph could be having this kind of behavior that it's you know, curving, in fact, it might be curving and going like this also. Okay. Now let us say that I want to find the instantaneous rate of change at this particular value of X, which is let's say X one at this point E. So in other words, what I want to do is that, is that at this point, I want to draw a line, but that line is not between two points A and B. Okay. I want to draw what is called a tangent line, which immediately shows me the instantaneous rate of change or the specific rate of change at that particular point itself. So I want to draw a line, which is something like this. And this thing will be called the tangent line. 
and you can see that if i draw tangents at different positions how they are having different slopes if for example if i draw the tangent at this position p you can see that that tangent line will look something like this at another position the tangent line might look something like this so this is the tangent at x2 y2 or let's say the point b b is this point over here so this is a sort of intuitive meaning of what we mean by instantaneous rate of change so what we want to do is that we want to find the slope of the tangent to the graph drawn at x1 y1 so instantaneous rate of change yes nishchay sir so in general slope of any secant or tangent defines the uh, measure of inclination of it uh, from the positive x axis right yes yes in general it defines the tan theta so slope means tan theta so the measure of inclination but what is the difference between secant line and tangent line tangent line is a line which is drawn at a particular instant or at a particular point on the graph and it just touches the graph at that point whereas secant line is a line that actually joins two particular points two distinct particular points on the graph so you can understand now that the whole business of drawing a tangent line is much more complex than drawing a secant line right yes sir so that is where calculus comes into play calculus you can say is a mechanism it's a mathematical machine which tells us how to draw this tangent and how to find its slope because as of now we don't have any geometrical method of drawing the slope is just like i have drawn a rough idea rough estimate of what the tangent should look like but can i actually do the calculation from this estimate no i have to develop some kind of machinery for that do you understood this point yes sir okay so you can just make a quick rough note of this definition if you like and then we will see how we actually come down to drawing this tangent or finding out the slope of the tangent okay this is just an idea of rough idea of what we are trying to do we are trying to draw a line such that it just sort of intersects the curve at that particular point and then we are trying to find the slope of it and we are then defining that okay the slope is equal to the instantaneous rate of change okay so now let's try to develop a bit more of idea of what we are trying to do over here so let's say i am putting this point a under a microscope so i'm magnifying it many times i'm putting it under a hand lens or a magnifying glass so if i draw a magnified version of this point yeah so i might come up with a diagram like this now let's say but i have to draw a much thicker line because it's magnified okay and now that point e is this point okay now the tangent line that i'm drawing that would become something like this
okay this would be something like the tangent tank so what i'm doing is i'm trying to join a with the point in a's neighborhood which is very very close to a in fact you know if you think if you magnify it enough a curve that from outside should look like this if you magnify it enough number of times it should actually look like a collection of line segments one after the other if you magnify it enough it should look so that curve at a particular point it should look like a collection of dashes like this so if the point a is lying at a particular intersection here so we have to just extend that particular dash between a and the next neighborhood point so what we can say is that this second point is the point right adjacent to a okay. so it is right adjacent in such a way that it almost merges with a So it almost. But then, sir, doesn't it lose its definition as a tangent? Yeah, that's that's the interesting thing. If I take two separate points, it loses the definition as a tangent. It becomes a secant tangent. That's very correct. But now, if I say that it's so close that it's almost merged with A, then you are back to the definition of the tangent. Right? You understanding the point? Yes, sir. Hmm. so what i am basically now saying is that if x is equal to x1 at the point a okay then x should be equal to x1 plus delta x but under something called a limit such that delta x is so small that is almost tending to zero okay. this kind of thing it is called a limit at the point Which is adjacent to x, uh, adjacent to a. Okay, so then you can see that the slope of this tangent line which is basically instantaneous rate of change. this is also delta y by delta x but it is under that special condition it is under what we call that limit okay it's under this limit that delta x should be extremely small okay and this limit is such that the smaller the value of delta x we are taking the more accurate our calculation of slope of tangent is going to be okay so it is like ultimately see physics is about a subject of measurement na so the way we are doing the measurement the smaller the value of delta x the more accurate our calculation of the instantaneous rate of change is going to be from that measurement are you understanding the point beta yes so so for example if we were if if y was representing distance s and t x was representing time t then this delta y by delta x is nothing but distance upon time so if this is s2 minus s1 upon t2 minus t1 it is representing average speed okay so i am taking this as distance and not as displacement whereas if it is delta s by delta t but under the condition that delta t is very small it is tending to zero then it is representing what it is representing instantaneous speed now in that in that measurement of instantaneous speed let's say i'm actually using a speedometer or something so the smaller the value of time the speedometer is able to calculate the distance for the more accurate the measurement of that speedometer will be so typically speedometers analog speedometers use the rotation of the wheel the rotation the rate of rotation of the wheel to measure the instantaneous speed so if i have one uh, you know one uh, speedometer which measures five rotations the time taken for five rotations of the wheel that will give me a certain accuracy of average speed but if i have a better designed one which is telling me the time taken for a single rotation of the wheel then that one is that 
much more accurate now because the time taken for one rotation is one fifth the time taken for five rotations roughly. Okay, is the point clear? Yes, sir. Okay, so I know I'm coming to the end of the lecture, but I will just take another two three minutes to illustrate this point with an example. Okay, and with that example, we will learn the first operation of differentiation today indirectly. So let's take the example of the graph we were talking about earlier. Y is equal to X squared. Okay. Now, what we will do is we will calculate delta Y by delta X, first of all, for the interval X is equal to 1 to X equal to 2. So X1 equal to 1 to X2 equal to 2. Then we will calculate instantaneous rate of change. Okay. At x equal to 1. Okay. Now for that, remember instantaneous rate of change. Is equal to how much it is delta y by delta x, but under this special condition, what we call the limit that delta x should be tending to zero. So it should be very small. So in this case, we will actually give an idea of how small. Okay, so in the first case, take delta x equal to 0 0.1. In the second case, take delta x to be even quite a bit smaller. Take it as 0.001. Okay, and let's see what is the value of the instantaneous rate of change that we get. Okay. So just try this out, people. Take a minute and I'll discuss it. Okay. Yeah, what is the answer for the first part? Or three. Yes, very good. Anyone else? Three. Yes, sir. Three. Three. No? three. three. Oh, okay. Three. So the first part is pretty simple, right? We have got y is equal to x square. We've got x1 equal to 1. So that means y1 will be equal to x1 square or 1. We have got x2 equal to 2. So we have got y2 equal to x2 square. So that is 4. So now we can see that delta y by delta x is equal to y2 minus y1 upon. So this you can see is a you know simple algorithmic process. I have to just substitute every step and there's no reason why anything can go wrong in this after that. So this is equal to three, okay. Also, if we interpret this step geometrically, that's also a good thing to do at this stage. Let's understand what we are doing so that we have the full clarity. Okay, so what we are doing in this step is so let's say 
now i'm drawing only on the positive side because i don't need the negative side so this is our graph okay. so let us say this is the point 1 comma 1 and somewhere here is let's say the point two comma four so i'm just drawing that second line between these two points so the second line slope that will be equal to delta y by delta x so in other words what i'll be doing is i just be joining these two points with a straight line that be calculating tan theta for that straight line so tan theta is equal to slope of second line that is equal to average rate of change okay so that's what i mean okay but now if we come to the second part anyone got the answer for the second parts a part 2.1 so 1.1 2.1 2.1 no something like that you will be getting okay so what i will first do is i will try to understand what i am doing graphically then i will come back to so again in general this is my graph now this is the point x equal to 1 y equal to 1 so now what i'll do, do is i want to draw the tangent at this point so to understand how i'm drawing the tangent especially given my values i'm going to magnify this so when i magnify it i'll get this some kind of graph like this at that point so now what i'm doing is this point i'm taking as x equal to 1 but in my a part i'm taking delta x tending to 0 as delta x actually 0.1 so it's actually not that good an approximate because because 0.1 is not that small a number but anyway so then i'm taking this point the so called next point as x equal to how much i'm taking x1 as this i'm taking x2 as 1.1 okay and then what i'm doing is i'm calculating y1 as x1 square and y2 and then i'm calculating the slope of this so i'm calculating this delta y by this delta x and from that i'm basically constructing this tangent line okay so in this case my instantaneous rate of change is limit delta x tending to 0 so very small value of delta x delta y by delta x okay so in this case that would become how much that would become 1 plus 0.1 squared minus 1 squared divided by 1 plus 0.1 minus 1 so you can see that this will become Zero point two one upon zero point two one. Okay, so this will become two point one. So two two point one is a sort of approximate slope of tangent. If I take the value of delta x as approximately point one. Okay. Now what's happening in the second case when I'm taking delta x even smaller? In this case, how much is this coming out to be?
come out to be 1 plus 0 0 0.001 whole square minus 1 square upon it's not. So we can use the a square minus b square formula that will actually help a little bit. So this will be 0 0.001 into 2.001 divided by 0 0.001. So I'm just using this formula that a square minus b square upon a minus b. So that becomes a plus b. So this time I'm getting this. So I'm getting the instantaneous rate of change. But again, this I'll have to say is approximately equal you know, because I have not taken delta x as exactly tending to zero. It's an approximation when delta x is taken as 0 0.001. Okay. Similarly, this was an approximation of instantaneous rate of change. This was an approximation of it when we have taken delta x equal to 0.1. Now it should be obvious to us that this is a better approximation compared to this one because the value of delta x is quite a bit smaller. It's one hundredth, right? This is clear. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Now let us understand how we can come to an exact answer. So how we can come to an exact answer? Now this is a new symbol we will learn. Dy by dx. Okay. This is the special symbol. For instantaneous rate of change. And we will talk about more about this in the next lecture. We'll talk about more of the symbol and its meaning also. So this instantaneous rate of change is 100% accurate. You can say maximum accuracy kind of calculation of limit delta x tending to zero, delta y by delta x. So let's do this calculation now theoretically without taking any particular values. So if I do it theoretically, now I want to find out instantaneous rate of change at x equal to one. So what I should do is I should calculate limit delta x tending to zero. Okay. Now the function was what? It was y equal to x square. So it should be one plus delta x whole square minus one square divided by delta x with a condition that delta x is tending to zero. Right, this point yes, is clear to all of you? Yes, sir. Okay, so now expand this. So it's very simple. You can see that this becomes limit delta x tending to zero of two times delta x divided by delta x. Actually, it becomes a little more complicated than that. I'll explain. This becomes two delta x plus delta x whole square divided by delta x. And the one cancels out. Okay. So further, it becomes limit delta x tending to zero, two plus delta x. Right, so we are clear up to this step? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So that means what is the most accurate possible value when delta x is so small that it is what we call infinitesimal. Delta x tending to zero, it is what we call infinitesimal. Another way, way to explain that would be that delta x is equal to one upon n, where n is tending to infinity. It's that small. Right? It's one upon n, where n is tending to infinity. So it's like, you know, it could be one upon 10 to the power 50, or it could be one upon 10 to the power 100, something like that. So n is that larger number. So in that case, this delta x is negligible compared to 2. So it will become exactly equal to 2. So the smaller the value of delta x we are taking now, the closer we are coming to the value of 2. So that that is again like the limit of an infinite sum a series, you know. Like for example, when we had taken delta x as 0.1, we had got dy by dx as 2.1. When we took delta x as 0 0.001, we observed that dy by dx the instantaneous rate of change became 2.001. Like that, if we had taken delta x to be, let's say, 
five zeros and then one, or ten raised to the minus six, we would have seen that we would have got d y by d x as two point zero 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 one. So like that, when we are taking it infinitesimal, that is, it is tending to zero. You know, it's one upon n where n is tending to infinity. So in that case, what happens? It will exactly become equal to. So this is the exact value of the instantaneous rate of change because it's converging to that. You know, the smaller the value of delta x we're taking, the closer it's coming to two. So as it converges to zero delta x, the value should converge to two. Okay. So this so, is the exact value of instantaneous. Exact. Yeah, so that is the thing now, which is the argument match-wise, you know. You're understanding the point. Like, you know, two mathematicians were arguing that if I have that series, one by four plus one by four square plus one by four cube, going up to one by four to the power n, n tending to infinity. So one guy asked the other, how much is this? He said, nonchalantly, it's one by three. But the other guy said, no, you're wrong. It is always slightly less than one by three. You're understanding the point, no? Yes, sir. But then the first guy says, okay, by how much it is smaller than one by three? So he says that it is smaller by a number where one by four to the power n, n is tending to infinity. So it's smaller by a number which is zero, no? Because one by infinity is tending to zero. Yes, sir. Okay. So that is the whole interesting thing about, uh, you know, uh, calculus and the whole point of infinite and infinitesimal. But we'll talk more about this because this is a bit abstract. Okay. So that is why I started today's discussion by giving you an idea about how an infinite series can converge into something infinitesimal. Okay, you can understand that visually in the geometrical example, you can understand that through a certain kind of algebra. You can give a proof of that also by algebraically. The second method which I was describing you for this series is some. You know, that, that is a sort of algebraic proof of it also. But ultimately, if you, if you think about it very closely enough, you will come to the idea that it's like this, that if I'm bringing these two points closer and closer, the closer I'm bringing the second point to the first point, the more close the slope of the tangent is coming to two. So when it exactly merges with the first point, such that these are two consecutive points on the straight line, uh, on, on the curve, the straight line that I will get, which is the perfect tangent, it will have a slope which is exactly equal to two. So, so like in the whole process, like C can become standard, right? Yes, yes, yes. The moment, so the closer the value of delta x is coming to zero, the more your line is going from the property of secant line to the property of tangent line. You're understanding my point, no? Yes, sir. Okay. Sir, so, so it is very, very close to 2, so that it's exactly 2, right? Uh, see, there's a difference. Now, not only we are seeing it's very, very close to 2. Very, very close to 2, so I have this example. I have taken delta x ko 0, 0, 0, 1 liya. Yeah, a core example, I could have taken it as 0. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, something one like this one. But what I'm actually showing in this calculation, which is on this side now, in this calculation, I'm showing that the smaller the value of delta x that I'm taking, the more it is converging towards two. You understanding, na? Yes, this is yes, the sir. true meaning of that limit, na? Ki main delta x ko jitna chota leta jaunga, ye two se utna close hota jayega. So if delta x is, let's say, one upon, two, uh, one upon 10 to the power one crore, Okay, then you can imagine how close it is to two, no? Yes, sir. But even that is not infinitesimal because I've written it as a number, no? One upon 10 to the power one crore. I've written that as a number, but it should be such a large number now that I cannot write it down. That is the meaning of infinitesimal, no? Then. So in that case, the value of this will exactly become equal to two. Okay, so I hope the difference between the two is uh, the same. You know, saying that it is almost equal to two and saying that it actually converges to the value of two as delta x becomes very, very small, infinitesimal. Yes, sir, got it. Okay, so it is a little bit abstract, but you think of it, you know, you revise this, you think of it from the algebraic limit equation that I've shown you, then you think of it visually, geometrically also, and you will get more and more comfortable with this idea it actually converges to a particular value. So we can actually calculate the slope of tangent at a particular point. We can draw it with a specific value of the slope and all that. And that is what the, the first part of calculus, that is differential calculus is going to be about. Okay. So we are, we are going to do uh, differential calculus in more detail in our next lecture. So in the meantime, I will uh, forward you some, uh, maybe some reading material about this also. And you revise this lecture carefully. 
okay and uh, you can also go ahead and read some stuff from module number 1 uh, the second part of it which is basic calculus the first part is factors okay so hope you people have enjoyed today's lecture uh, sorry for the bit of delay in completing the lecture and extra time we'll try to keep it on time from next time okay so wish you all the best that's it for today's session people sir can you Thank please you, share this lectures pdf yes yes both the recording and the pdf i will be sharing on the group okay you will get it by today evening right Okay, sir. Bye, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, can Thank you so much. Bye, sir. Yeah. Sir, can we create a special, uh, you know, Google Drive for uh, all these recordings so that we will get it at one place? Yeah, yeah. In any case, now uh, we we will have a YouTube uh, like there's a channel for each of the tracks. Okay, okay sir. And uh, also, uh, you know, there is on the IITN Hub website. Right now, there is a dedicated space where uh, each of your batches has a link. and if you click on the link like there will be a table with all the lectures uh, the links to the lecture recordings as well as the notes and assignment and all that okay sir but if you are more comfortable with google drive you can create a google drive yourself there's no problem with that you know okay sir okay okay thank you sir bye sir okay thank you sir bye sir okay bye to all the best sir i enjoyed your lecture thank you very much i enjoyed taking it it's good to get your feedback very nice okay. wish you all the best people Thank you sir bye sir okay bye people